Hello there. Today we have with us Mr. Avni Sabarwal, the managing director at Accenture Ventures. He's going to share some thoughts on uh, digital and uh, digital disruption. Avni Shpir Nantam, the CEO of Accenture, has said that more than 50% of global Fortune 500 companies have fallen out of that list mainly because of digital. So the first question for me is, what exactly is digital? How do you look at it? I think people have uh, you know different definitions. Then you go to any organization, you will find a different way of uh, how they describe or define a digital. Uh, from our perspective or from my personal point of view, it's more uh, a mindset uh, than anything else. And uh, what by, with that, what I mean is that uh, it is a way of doing things differently. It is uh, trying to unlock value from your physical world by creating a virtual twin and uh, leveraging digital technologies. And uh, it's also a big cultural transformation as well. So. Uh, you know, when we talk about digital in Accenture, a lot of focus is given in terms of what is the impact of digital or how digital will be leveraged by the human. Yeah. And because we feel that human is right in the middle of all this transformation and all these technologies. And if we don't pay enough emphasis on that part, uh, most of the digital transformation are liable to get failed. So that would be my way of describing what digital is, uh, a little more transactional would be that we see digital playing in three key areas. First is how do you use digital to improve customer experience, which we call digital customer. Second is how do you use digital technologies to improve your own internal processes and systems, and that is a digital enterprise for us. And finally, you can use digital to completely disrupt and transform a business model. So these three would be the key components of, a digit, of any digital implementation. All right, so that's a great definition. In the same breath, can you also define what digital is not? The reason why I'm asking this question is there is a lot of misconception about what digital is and it is not. So it will be good to hear that from you. What digital is not? I think what digital is not, I alluded to that a little bit, which is that it is not independent technology. So somebody has built a mobile app or somebody is doing some work in a public cloud or somebody has got a website or doing some you know, analytics. Those desperate uh, kind of... Uh, technologies and uh, initiatives which are happening in let's say silos of an organization is not what I would describe as digital. Yes, there are pockets of things where people are trying to do something. But uh, for me, digital is a, a enterprise wide kind of a transformation. So the overall organization right from the leadership to all the other people are involved in that. So if the if digital is happening in pockets and silos, then it is not digital. That's the first thing. Second is that uh, digital, if, that, if digital is happening in a few of your processes uh, and a few of your systems, again, that is not digital because it ends up touching uh, you know, all the three parts, as I said, your business model, your customer experience, as well as your internal processes. And thirdly, it is certainly not about uh, IT and technology. Uh, digital is much more business than anything else. Uh, it is also a key uh, strategic imperative of all the business leaders. So it's much more a business issue than a technology issue. So that would be my answer. Okay, wonderful. Um, so in the past, we've come across acronyms like SMAC, Social Media Mobility Analytics Cloud, and WUCA as well. So how different is digital from some of these trends? What is unique about um, digital and why should we take it seriously? I think, uh, you know, we were talking about the statement by, given by our chairman, and I think that's uh, quite a... Profound statement. Uh, more than 50% of the organizations are going to disappear, uh, you know, in the next few years. And these are organizations which are which have been iconic over the last, you know, many years. All of them are getting uh, displaced by platform companies. So on one hand, digital is a massive disruptor, right? It is disrupting organizations, it's disrupting businesses, and it's also disrupt disrupting industries. On the other hand, also we have statistics which say that uh, traditional organizations, as they go ahead, about 30 to 35 percent of their incremental revenue is going to come from digital, right? So you have an organization which, on one hand, if it can mobilize 
their capabilities and capacities in a digital uh, point of view you will have a significant growth happening and if they are not then they will uh, they are in the risk of getting disrupted and actually disappearing a good example uh, which has happened recently is toys r us it was a great organization um, you know very well known for their brand and the kind of stuff they do they were very early in the digital game with amazon but uh, for all the wrong reasons uh, you know or the wrong decisions which they did they are now you know they have filed bankruptcy right so uh, digital is a powerful force it depends upon uh, how you are able to use it whether you are able to use it to give you your, your growth or momentum or your competitors are able to use it better yeah okay great so uh, you spoke about platforms in this answer so in the industrial age companies used to have a linear business model where the focus was on the product whereas today you you just spoke about platforms why is becoming a platform important in the digital context well if you look at the top uh, fortune 500 company now if you look at the first 10 maybe you know you will probably find six or seven of them uh, which are platform companies you know these organizations were not there 6 8 years back but the kind of speed at which they have grown and the kind of uh, uh, market uh, capitalization they are showing uh, they are much ahead of what i call the pipeline or the value chain as you said uh, companies so you know what happens in a value chain uh, organization is that you have you know several inputs going and you have in the end you have the output coming and in something which happens in the middle in terms of you know working on those inputs uh, and that's a traditional pipeline business uh, platform business is different it uh, it basically works on what i call the network effect right you have many sellers or you have many buyers and then you have people who are controlling the platform and uh, it's the power of network which makes uh, this particular business model uh, go rather than uh, the pipeline business and uh, studies have shown that whenever there is a competition between a pipeline business and a platform business the platform business will always win right so that is the reason why traditional organizations are trying to reinvent their businesses in addition to their traditional value chain business they are trying to build um, platform businesses a great example of a very traditional organization is ge and ge is uh, very successfully gone into a platform business where, dig where ge digital is now contributing significant amount of revenue uh, to the traditional business of ge as well okay wonderful so what does it take for an organization that has a a value chain based business model or a pipeline based model to transform itself into a networked you know business model i think the first thing uh, you know which a traditional organization needs to look into uh, when they are transforming to a platform organization is that most of the organizations uh, which are a value chain based organization are very in internal focused right they are trying to basically improve their own processes and improve their efficiency and productivity as soon as you get into the uh, a platform business you are outside in focused right so you have an ecosystem which you need to cater to which you need to build secondly in a value chain business you are most always focused on how do you serve your customer better and in a platform business you know there are many customers you have many stakeholders so you have to look at uh, at it from an entirety point of view that there are stakeholders there are ecosystem players which need to be uh, you know looked into just and just not your customer and thirdly i think from a leadership perspective as well you know that there are leaders who have successfully managed pipeline businesses but uh, they have to significantly change their own mindset when they start uh, managing a platform business and again i think the most important thing is uh, collaboration and the view which is leveraging the external ecosystem in the organization those things are very critical and most of the traditional businesses which have not been able to transform successfully in the platform business have not been able to do these things a great example is uh, robot medoc you know he uh, he bought myspace and uh, wanted to run myspace as a top down kind of a hierarchy and we know what happened you know it was a great uh, product or a great platform but it fizzled out because it doesn't work the way you will manage a pipeline business so i guess those are the differences and uh, how it needs to be managed right so uh, you touched upon digital culture a little bit uh, when you spoke about the top down what are possibly the three four things that organizations have to think about when they are building digital culture i think the most important for me when we are building a digital culture is collaboration right a lot of organizations uh, still work in silos 
uh, at best collaboration happens uh, on a vertical side so it's like uh, top down you know command and control kind of a collaboration but uh, when we are talking about digital we are talking about horizontal collaboration so organizations will need to break those silos if they are really serious about digital so i think collaboration would be one of my number one uh, priorities the second trait would be uh, acceptance to failure right uh, digital is something which is still evolving and uh, there is nobody or there is no organization which has all the answers worked out so i think you need to give enough leverage and enough bandwidth to your organization and to your employees to make mistakes uh, and they should not be afraid of doing that uh, because i think a lot of success actually will follow the mistakes which happen which is very different to what used to happen earlier so this uh, acceptance to failure uh, and uh, taking that as part of you know your organization's uh, transformation is very important and i think the third one which i would uh, put here is the leverage of ecosystem so uh, you know as we had enterprise architects and it architects uh, earlier we're going to have uh, uh, ecosystem architects these are the people who are going to go and understand what would be the future ecosystem of an organization and they are going to go and design that so no organization whether it is accenture or nowscape or anybody else can have all the answers and all the capabilities so you will need to build your ecosystems and in the future i think it will be a competition between multiple ecosystems rather than individual organizations so leveraging the ecosystem collaborating across the silos and being open to failure would be probably three intrinsic parts of our digital culture wonderful all right people today say data is a new oil how are companies deriving value out of data yeah i think it's a it's a very common saying now that data is the new oil and ai is the new electricity uh, so that's what uh, what's going on in the industry but i i would agree with that i think uh, you know earlier we didn't have the technology and we didn't have the computing power to and even uh, technologies to extract the data but now if you look at the kind of uh, things which are happening from a connected uh, world point of view and the iot you know we have now 500 billion or maybe even more uh, devices which are connecting so uh, data has now become more in terms of both the volume as well as the velocity of data has uh, significantly increased and the ability of organizations to use different technologies to make sense of both structured and unstructured data is giving them insights uh, which they never had earlier and and that's what's creating value uh, but i think that is also the limitation of most of the organization that uh, you know unless they have their data layer fixed uh, no amount of digital technologies is going to work and the most of the organization are struggling with that uh, you know if you go to a manufacturing company Uh, which has been using traditional machines for a long time it's very difficult to actually extract data from those machines and if you can't do that then obviously the the analytics and the rest of the artificial intelligence or machine learning which you want to use you will not be able to do that but organizations uh, are spending significant amount of money i think uh, many organizations and many clients which we work with have spent uh, you know as i said significant amount of money to just build their data layer first and uh, once that is done then they start planning in terms of what would be the uh, the other digital services which they would provide but getting digital uh, layer uh, right is i would say the first step and as i said that uh, because of the technology is available and the ability to make sense of structured and unstructured data almost at a real time yep. is what's creating value wonderful machines are increasingly taking over human jobs your thoughts on human machine coexistence I think you know this again is uh, something which is hotly debated uh, in today's world and my personal point of view on this is that uh, I think artificial intelligence and robotics and automation is going to take 60 70% of the jobs which exist today I don't have any doubts about that but on the other hand it's also going to significantly create new jobs those new jobs which don't exist today so uh, I think in some way there will be a balance but uh, you know anything which is commoditized and transactional and uh, you know is repetitive will definitely go to the ai agent or 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 your bot or uh, you know an automation agent but uh, many new opportunities will come up and that that is the reason why the reskilling uh, becomes very important for organizations and individuals alike uh, because they will continuously need to learn uh, in your own words just in time just enough would be very very important as you go ahead just to keep pace with this particular thing so i i i think that there's going to be massive disruption there is no doubt about that but in the end the machines are there to augment 
the human capability and uh, if they are not going to do it then uh, you know obviously there's going to be a big unrest so i feel that both of them will coexist they will augment into each other's capabilities uh, but yes disruption is going to happen and many jobs which exist today or have existed for years will no longer be there while agility in project management is well understood it has been in existence for some time now how do organizations become agile from a strategy point of view see uh, i think that's a very key question uh, for big organizations including accenture uh, as we become more and more bigger uh, our agility reduces and that's something which uh, is uh, you know is a key part of our future strategy because agility uh, is again a mindset in terms of how quickly an organization can pivot and uh, from our point of view we uh, learn agility from our startup partners right so while accenture brings the entire scale and the customer relationship and uh, you know our huge infrastructure but when we look into that how do uh, how does a big organization still uh, behave like a small nimble agile organization uh, i think our partnerships with many startups including yourself have shown us the way and uh, the way you know for example the the dna of a startup or the lean startup methodology is now getting embedded in uh, in accenture uh, even in our consulting methodology we have something called form and if you look at what form is form is completely disrupting the way earlier you know uh, consulting was done so just to give you an example we used to go as a consultant and do a as is analysis for 6 8 weeks uh, now the client is no longer ready to pay for that uh, and they want value creation right from the day one so that is the requirement of agility now when we use you know agile platform then we go to do such kind of an assessment before going to the client we have almost done all that and we have a maturity model in our hand so for example if we are doing an assessment of the supply chain processes what is their maturity model in supply chain compared to the best practices in the industry would always already be available to us so these things are going to be becoming critical and again when we look into product development for example uh, you know we are now doing again you know taking lessons from the startups to do mvps so it's not that we are going to be doing iterative you know or uh, water waterfall product uh, you know development it's all agile so similarly the you know whether it's in product development or whether it is strategy we don't we no longer have you know two year strategy the one year strategy strategy is now very dynamic very fluid and uh, it changes as the environment changes which is constant so we no longer do those big exercises of you know annual strategy uh, summits and you know having a 3 year strategy or a 5 year strategy because those things are irre irrelevant now we need agility and uh, that is why agility becomes the intrinsic part of our strategy formulation great learning agility is a key agenda in digital what is personally your learning method how do you keep up i think again i am probably very fortunate because of my role i keep up because i work with wonderful uh, and the most innovative and disruptive startups in areas which are very relevant to accenture whether it's artificial intelligence blockchain or ar vr or cyber security so i don't really have to make a, a you know a, a separate kind of a effort to do that it's my job and uh, you know when i'm working with entrepreneurs like yourself who are trying to change the world leveraging these technologies my most of my learning comes from that so from that perspective i learn every day because i i am with startups every day and what will be your advice for others who don't have this opportunity well too bad i think uh, i think i would advise them that yes they should uh, reach out and you know try and somehow get connected with the startup ecosystem because uh, you know whether you like it or not that's where the best uh, learning comes from uh, in terms of the latest trends which are happening and i think the other thing for other employees you know who are looking into this i would say that your learning is in your hands so if you're sitting around there thinking what your organization is going to do and what kind of courses they are going to send you that's not going to happen so if you want to keep pace with the way the world is going uh, you need to keep and and you know make sure that you are keeping pace with the with the learning part of it as well and interactions with startups and uh, you know learning and doing these short courses on moocs and you know other stuff there are many things available which you should be able to do so again you know small learnings uh, just in time always constantly trying to uh, reinvent your uh, you know knowledge is very important great and the final question is about your prediction for 2030 how does the world look like in 2030 see i think it's very difficult to predict uh, what the world will look like in the next year as well or maybe even next month it is changing as we speak 
right? The kind of change and the unprecedented pace at which things are changing uh, is just phenomenal, right? So it's never happened. I think it's, as I said, it's difficult to make a prediction, but one thing I'll be, I think I'm more or less certain is that a new leader, uh, you know, in the, let's say in 2030, will be leading a team which will be comprising of humans and bots. So, you know, he will have many bots who will be doing the same thing as the humans are doing and uh, he will have to develop new capabilities to deal with this kind of a very interesting and complex phenomenon. So, I don't want to go into other predictions. Uh, I think there could be, you know, obviously AI and blockchain are going to be right up there in terms of getting in mainstream. But uh, I think from a leadership perspective, I'm very clear that it's not going to be just a human workforce. And uh, the leaders will have to constantly or, you know, look into how they manage this very interesting uh, kind of a new workforce, which, in which includes machines and artificial agents as well as humans. Wonderful. It's a pleasure talking to you, Avnish. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thanks for having me, Rajiv. Thank, Thank you. you.